Last week, an independent beauty brand called Blend Bunny Cosmetics discontinued their eyeshadow palette called Sugar and Grunge. And it wasn't the typical reason why companies discontinue items. It was because they received a cease and desist letter from another company. Apparently, this other company said they owned the rights to use the word grunge in cosmetics. I know the 90s called and said there's no way <laughs> that this is actually real. But in a move that surprised a lot of you, Maggie Jones, who is the founder of Blend Bunny, decided to listen to the cease and desist and discontinue the palette, kind of giving this other company a win for what appeared to be an egregious and very, very false claim. And when we talked about this story and what's up in makeup, my makeup news show last week, a lot of you had a lot to say about about it. Others of you wondered very smartly whether this person, this company, would have the guts to go after Huda Beauty because she has an entire range called Pretty Grunge. But the biggest question, and I think this came from a place of caring, a place of wanting to see the person in the right win, but the most passionate responses came from people who were just upset that Blend Bunny gave in to something that they thought was absolutely ridiculous. Why did didn't Blend Bunny just throw the cease and desist away because it is not a formal legal document. It's basically a request. So today we are going to address that through the lens of a story that I found from all the way back in 2018, 2019, having to do with a different indie brand called Glamlight Cosmetics. They have gotten very big over the last five, six years. And the founder slash owner of Glamlight Cosmetics, Giselle Hernandez. In October of 2019, Giselle uploaded a video to her personal YouTube channel. The video was called The Truth Behind Being a Beauty Brand Owner. And in the video, Giselle gives us some ideas as to why Maggie Jones, the owner of Blend Bunny Cosmetics, may have made the choices that she did. It is a fascinating story. This is one that flew completely below my personal radar. The video that Giselle put up has about 6,000 views. This was not covered in major media, and I think it's time that we talk about it. So if you are interested in learning about what happened to Giselle back then and why some indie brands need to make these hard decisions, this is Behind the Controversy, and it's starting right now. Hello, my friend. Welcome to my channel or welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Jen and I run this channel. It is called Jen Love. And on this channel, we talk about things that are happening in the beauty industry, things that aren't necessarily always talked about. I have a makeup news show called What's Up in Makeup that runs every single weekend. But in today's video and in videos like this and my Behind the Controversy segment, I like to talk about things that happened in the past and talk about them from a lens of today. What did we learn from that situation? And what can we continue to learn from that situation? If you enjoy this video and the content that I make here, a great free way to help me out is just to hit that little thumbs up button. It really does help so much. And if you do enjoy what you see, please hit the subscribe button to make sure that you are notified when I make new videos. But now we need to get started and we are getting started with Giselle's story and the video that she uploaded back in 2019. And the way that I'm gonna structure this is I'm gonna play parts of Giselle's video and then I'm going to comment a little bit on what she's saying and apply it to what's happening now. Also clarify some things. I did reach out to both Giselle and the company that sued her through Instagram. And I also reached out to the other company through email. I have not heard anything back through email. Uh, when I reached out to the other company for comments uh, through DM on Instagram, they actually sent me back an auto responder that directed me on how I could join their PR list. So I, I yeah, I haven't heard anything back from them, but if there's anything that they want to add, I will make sure that I put it in the description box and also in a pinned post. So here we go. Let's start with the first part of Giselle's story. Hi, everyone. My name is Giselle Hernandez, and I am the founder of Glamlight Cosmetics. I decided to do this video and sit down and talk to you guys about something that's been on my mind and something that's been affecting me now for quite a while. And it hasn't just been one thing. It's been multiple things that have been leading on to this moment. And it's not just me it's something that's been happening on in the industry especially through a lot of indie brands and many of us are just 
too afraid to speak up against it either because they don't have the resources or the platform to come out and say what's going on. A lot of the major brands are using something that I call financial bullying to either steal trademarks, steal patents, steal concepts and designs from indie brands that they know won't be able to afford litigations. Here's a quick disclaimer before I begin this video. Due to legal reasons, I'm not able to say the name of the actual brand that targeted me last year, but all court records are public. You can easily go and find it based on my last name because they were trying to keep things on the low and they wouldn't use the name of my company in the lawsuit. So of course, me being me and having my informal degree in Googling, I looked it up. And of course she's right, it is public. So allow me to introduce you to Kaiser versus Hernandez, the lawsuit. It was filed on January 12th of 2018. It was terminated on November 13th of 2018. The cause of it was trademark infringement and the documents for the plaintiff were filed by Glamcore Global LLC. And I was like, Glamcore? Glam, where have I heard that before? And where I remember them from was when I used to go to IMATS, the International Makeup Artistry Trade Show, when I used to go to that back in like 2016, 2017. I'm pretty sure Glamcore was there. They also came out with the Ricky mirrors, which were a little bit more quote unquote affordable versions of their Glamcore mirrors. The company essentially sell lights that help you to take better photographs or just be able to see things better. They sell these lights to makeup artists, to tattoo artists, and even to people in the medical field. So you may be asking yourself, Jen, what in the world, why is a makeup lighting company suing a color cosmetics company? And we are going to get to that in just a second, but before that, we need to talk a little bit more about the person behind this lawsuit, the Kaiser guy. His name is Eric Kaiser, and he is the founder and CEO of Glamcore. Glamcore's brand website says, quote, we're a logic-driven lighting company. We love pairing leading edge technology with a sleek design aesthetic. From the beginning, we've set out to thoughtfully solve challenges for artistic professionals whose best work depends on the best and brightest lighting. In the early 2000s, Glamcore founder and CEO Eric A. Kaiser observed that there just wasn't standardized high-quality portfolio portable and durable lighting anywhere on the market. That's why since 2010, we've stayed true to his founding vision to be the global leading brand designing and manufacturing ingenious lighted products for artisans. So why is Eric and Glamcore going after Glamlight, a makeup company? And the reason why is because Glamlight used to actually sell lights. I'm going to put on the screen for you a post from February of 2016. So this is two years before the lawsuit was filed. Glamlight shows how to use the product that they call the perfect light for a flawless selfie. And we see these now all the time, but I don't remember seeing these nearly as much back in 2016. The caption for the post reads, Glam Light is a smartphone ring light that allows you to take flawless, well-lit selfies even in the darkest room. Glam Light provides a constant light that allows you to see what you are shooting and select your level of brightness before snapping the photo. Unlike your phone's built-in flash, Glam Light reflects a natural light without harsh shadows or uneven lighting. To compare, I look back at Glamcore's Instagram account from back then and it doesn't look like they're selling anything like Glam Light's glam light, they were mostly selling lighted mirrors and also some lights that what they would do is they had like these arms, they still sell these, where there's two arms on either side and they have lights and then you put your phone in the middle and it's supposed to light you better. But by the time Glamcore actually sued glam light, it seems like they had pretty much moved on to exclusively color cosmetics. In November of 2017, glam light posted this video to their Instagram with the caption, "I the secret is finally out. We're so thrilled to announce our epic transition into cosmetics. We've been working nonstop for the past two years on creating the perfect formulas that we are finally able about to unveil to the world. The future of makeup is here. Welcome to the all new Glam Light Cosmetics. They launched with the Masterpiece palette and even started giving away free Glam Lights with purchases of $49 or more. 
So what I'm trying to say here is by the time Glamcore filed their lawsuit against Glamlight, Glamlight wasn't even really promoting lights anymore. I asked Giselle about the timing of this because I was wondering, did the lawsuit from Glamcore stop her from producing lights? And she said no, that the idea all along was to sell the lights in order to make enough money in order to transition to color cosmetics. So what happened? How did this end up in court? Let's go back to Giselle. She's going to explain it. So January 2018, I received a letter in the mail saying, you're being sued. But see, this wasn't like a legal court document. This wasn't the official, you're being served. This is a lawsuit. It simply said, you're being sued. However, my client is generous enough that he's willing to forfeit the whole lawsuit and he just wants to negotiate with you. All he's asking is that you give him your registered trademark for a particular product that I have at that time and your social media account. When I read that, I'm like, there has to be some kind of mistake. Like I have the certificate that says you own this trademark. It's one of those little cute in a cute little frame in my office. So I'm thinking there must be some kind of mistake. So I contact this attorney and I let him know, hey, um, this is my trademark. I trademarked this a year ago. I own this trademark. I'm not giving you anything. So we began the court proceedings. Okay, we need to pause Giselle for a second because we need to clarify a couple of things and add to the story. So the first thing is that when she talks about the trademark that she owned, that was for specifically the word Glamlight, her entire brand name. But it was also the name of that little tiny light. And what Giselle clarified to me was that at the time she was expanding the trademark to include not just these small lights, but also mirrors. And that's when Glamcore decided they were going to jump in and try to stop the process. Here's the timeline. So she filed initially in April of 2016 and then she registered. The whole thing went through in February of 2018, but Giselle was sued in January of 2018. So what happened there? According to Giselle, and this matches up with the USPTO records, Glamcore tried to put in opposition for this trademark that she was filing. They put that in in September of 2017 to be like, hold off. We want to see if we can stop this from happening. The USPTO decided to reject whatever it is that Glamcore was trying to do because we can see that the USPTO terminated this uh, opposition that Glamcore put in. The USPTO is showing that they are on Glamlight's side on this, that they had a right to produce lighted mirrors. So when the USPTO didn't back up Glamcore, that's when Glamcore got their lawyers involved to send Giselle that we're going to sue you letter to scare her into canceling that trademark before it officially went through. So they filed the lawsuit in January. She had the choice of saying to the USPTO, no, I changed my mind. I don't want this anymore and stop it right there. But she did not do that. She let the process finish out because that opposition is really the very last step before it's a officially and totally yours. She let it be hers and Glamcore did not like that. So for the next part of the story, let's go back to Giselle. After a few weeks of this going on, I came to find out that this attorney was actually disbarred and he was not allowed to practice law. And that's when I realized that this case was never meant to go to trial. This was going to be a bullying tactic. For months, we continued going back and forth. So this is where things actually get quite interesting. The plaintiff requested that we have a conference, a settlement conference. And as soon as we were all there present, the plaintiff and his attorney began their statement like this. Well, we're here because we want to make a generous offers, offer to Mrs. Hernandez. Said it just like that, with Mrs. Hernandez, because um she comes from very humble beginnings. Um, my client comes from a very wealthy family. Who walks into a courtroom and begins a statement like that? Okay. So at that point, I stop and I think. I just want to pause here to say if this story is true, and I personally believe Giselle, but I have no proof that this happened. So I have to say if this part is true, what disgusting behavior from a company if this actually happened. But 
I will tell you, unfortunately, it does get worse. Until a few months ago, my personal Instagram was private. On my public Instagram for the business, I had never shared anything about my finances. No one knew if I was broke or if I was rich or if I was struggling. I simply had a picture of myself and my last name, my first name. Nothing more, I think maybe a picture of my daughter. But yet these people are coming in here and saying, um, she cannot afford these these uh this kind of litigation, so we're doing her a favor by doing this settlement conference. In which they asked my attorneys, um, are you taking this case pro bono? My attorneys say, no, this is a paid client. And what bothered me was, I finally understood why, why me? This man saw my Instagram, he saw my trademark, he wanted it, it's a really unique trademark for that particular category, and he wanted it. That was the intention from the beginning. He felt that I wouldn't be able to defend myself. He had created a stereotype about me that because of how I look or my last name, because I'm Afro-Latina, that I wouldn't have the means and the resources to pay for attorneys to actually defend myself. In which, at that moment, the judge decides, hey, we're going to speak privately. And he goes to me, this guy has no case. You know it. He knows it. His attorneys know it, but he has deep pockets. He said it just like this. This man has deep pockets. So if or when you win this case, he is going to bury you in appeals. He's going to appeal you here in federal court. He's going to appeal you in front of the TTAB. So I'm asking you, are you willing to spend $200,000 of your hard-earned money, if you have that kind of money, to defend yourself, to defend your brand? And I looked at him and I said, yes. I didn't have that kind of money. But I said yes. He goes, are you willing to spend 500000 And I said yes. He took a deep breath and he said, are you willing to spend $700,000? And that right there, that was the turning point. When he said those words, I realized for the past 12 months, I had been bullied by this brand because this man came from a better family than me because he had more money to spend on attorney fees, that even though he had no case, he had chosen to destroy me because of who he is. At that very moment, I looked at the judge and I said, yes, I would spend whatever it takes to defend myself. Because see, it was no longer about me. If I allowed this man to get away with, with, it, with this, he was gonna do it to the next brand. And the next indie brand, they might not even, they might even have less resources than I have. So at that point, I told the judge, this is too late. I'm already too financially invested. Trial is next month. I'll be seeing him in trial. So unless you have any other financial reasons as to why I should abandon my brand, this conversation ends here. Quick, quick, that was that. So the next day, I received an email from my attorney, and he goes, the plaintiff is missing the lawsuit. You know why? Because I stood my ground. There was no case to begin with. And you know what's so crazy about this? That I'm not the only brand that this is being done to. So looking at the court documents, it does look like this was postponed a couple of times, the, uh, the mediation that Giselle is talking about. So it was originally scheduled for March, but then it was rescheduled for April because Glamcore requested it. And then the court had to change the date again from April, April to May 14th. And that was the pretrial conference that Giselle was talking about in the video. So at this point, both parties have been working at this for four months. And Giselle said on this entire process, she spent spent $41,000 of her own money to fight Glamcore. She's fighting Glamcore for a trademark that the USPTO says is 100% hers. The other piece Giselle was talking about was something that happened late in the game that ended up ending the whole thing. So the court documents do say that there was a settlement conference held on November 5th of 2018 and on November 9th, there was filed a stipulation of voluntary dismissal by the plaintiffs, by 
Glamcore. The case was officially terminated on November 13th. So what she's saying in the video tracks with the court documents that are public. In my Instagram DMs with Giselle, which again, she told me that I could share publicly, this is what she said. Once the USPTO issues a trademark certification, it's extremely difficult for someone to force them to retract it. In order to take my approved trademark, he would have had to challenge me in front of a T T A B, a T tab trial. I don't know how to pronounce that. A T tab. We'll call it a T tab trial. The process takes about seven years and costs an average of a half a million dollars. It's nearly impossible for the challenger slash appealing party to win. He would have to prove that the USPTO made a mistake when they approved my trademark. The USPTO rarely ever makes mistakes. Therefore, he filed the frivolous lawsuit in federal court because it's a lot easier and cheaper than doing the seven year trial. In this next part, Giselle talks about how common this practice is. I have one friend, phenomenal woman in the beauty industry. She trademarked something, you know, name of a product, very catchy, very unique. And this multi-billion dollar brand, like the name, so catchy, so trendy, it would do really well with the product. She owns that trademark. That woman spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend her trademark. She won, but see, that's the thing about intellectual property law. Even when you win, you've already, what, you've invested 100, 200,000, 300,000 defending something that's already yours. What a lot of the major brands are doing now, and I'm seeing this so often, I wouldn't even be speaking on this if it wasn't something that it's getting completely out of hand. You guys can even do your own research. I remember like at the same time that I was going through my lawsuit, I came across a case with hard candy versus Anastasia. And it really caught my interest because I was like, they were suing her for $14 million simply because one of the names of her eye and her eyeshadow palette was the name of their company. And they were claiming that consumers were confused. However, they lost the case because they never even bothered bringing it up to Anastasia. They simply filed a lawsuit. And even just the uh, a few months ago, something similar happened to another indie brand owner where she had came out with this beautiful collection, had a really catchy name, and all of a sudden this multi-million dollar brand say, well, we like your name and we're going to sue you for it. We're going to sue you for the intellectual property. So these lawsuits now are being created to steal concepts, designs, even patents. I, I'm seeing major brands coming up, the indie brands, for patents. And it's not just in the makeup industry, it's more like hair, everything that a lot of the IG brands. So of course, with my expert unofficial degree in Googling, I was able to find the ABH hard candy lawsuit, my friend. So this happened about six months before Giselle made the video that I'm showing you today. In this case, Hard Candy was suing ABH because they had a glow kit. And in that glow kit, they had one shade called Hard Candy. And in the filing, it says, quote, Anastasia says that it chose this name because the product had a shimmer that reminded the developer of candies that her grandmother gave her when she was young. The developer testified that she was aware of Hard Candy LLC as a seller of nail polish in the 1990s, but she was not aware of the company's continued existence when she came up with the name. And what's so funny is I have it. <laughs> In case you wanted to see it, this is the palette they got sued over. What are the freaking chances? And I had it sitting right there. It was so easy to find. All right, so here we go. This is the palette and you can see the shade over here called Hard Candy. Oh, my nail is chipped. That's not cute. So let's go ahead and swatch it so you can see what Hard Candy looked like. There it is. It's just a shimmery peachy color. Without getting too deep into the weeds of a whole different court case, here's the quick summary of what happened. So Endgame, quote, after a bench trial, the court found that there was no likelihood of confusion and held that defendant Anastasia Beverly Hills, Inc. made out a fair use defense to infringement. But Giselle brought this up in our IG conversation, and this is what she told me. She said, IP lawsuits can go on for years. Hard Candy sued a BH a few years ago and Anastasia had no other option but to take it to trial because Hard Candy wanted $60 million. 
dollars. Even with mediation, they were set on that amount. ABH dragged them in court. However, Anastasia had probably spent $400,000 in fees. I don't know how Giselle knows this, but I do know that a lot of brand owners talk to each other and I would not be surprised if that was information that she found out from Anastasia herself. And based on the research that I did, that sounds 100% possible. So bringing this back to Blend Bunny, the next thing that Giselle says in her video, remember from this is from 2019, really hits home what's happening with Maggie right now. What bothered me the most about my case and my day in court with this person was, I'll never forget these words. The judge came to me and he told me, look, at this point, he's not even asking for, for too much. At this point, he's even telling you that he's willing to let you keep your social media account. Um, just maybe change, you know, the font on the packaging because he, you know, he just wants something to stroke his ego at this point. Yeah. That's the way it is. Yeah. See, in this world, it doesn't matter how much you work hard to become successful, to accomplish something, to be something in life. Sometimes when you are a woman or a minority woman, you are expected to stroke someone's ego simply because you're poor or your skin color or things of that nature. And I'm sorry, but I'm not here to stroke anyone's ego. And that's the reason why I stood my ground. When all this happened, I was 27 years old. How many 27 year olds do you know that actually have $700,000 just sitting there that they can just use and dispose of to fight off fraudulent lawsuits? And these people know that. These people know that you don't have the same resources that they have to protect yourself. You're vulnerable, especially when you're starting off a brand. You can't participate in these litigations. You can't stand up for yourself in that way. When some of you commented that Blend Buddy would just throw out the cease and desist, you were absolutely 100% right. According to LegalZoom, the cease and desist letter doesn't do anything. All it does is advise you that you may be sued if you don't follow the demands of the letter. And in some cases, people do ignore cease and desist letters and nothing happens. But in other cases, you are then brought to court. And with Giselle, she was given a formal summons that she had to show up. And when you show up to court, you really should show up with a lawyer. To add on to that, there's an article in National Law Review. They say that to avoid unnecessary legal action, you need to respond to the demand letter and you need to formulate a strategic response that reflects both the relevant facts and the relevant law. And they said that this will most likely require a lawyer. Going back to LegalZoom, they specifically say, while it's tempting to announce on social media what this other person or company has done to you, don't use social media, text, email, make phone calls, or post anything about the other party. All of these will be admissible against you in court, and they will be found. Let the attorneys resolve this for you. So this might be why Maggie didn't say the name of the company that sent the cease and desist. Other than the facts of the things that she actually said was the reason why, which is that she didn't want to give them any kind of attention. Back to the National Law Review, they added, ideally a clear and well-drafted response to the cease and desist letter will put the matter to rest, but more than likely this is not going to happen, at least not right away. When rejecting a cease and desist demand, it is important to anticipate the possibility of litigation and legal proceedings and to factor this possibility into the recipient's overall response strategy. So we're talking with Glenn Amlight, they spent $41,000 in order to keep their brand name, their Instagram. Besides the lighting products that they actually stopped selling, Glamcore wanted Glamlight's entire social media presence that they had been building for the past couple of years. So she spent that $41,000 so that she wouldn't lose all of that work she did to build the brand to that point. Giselle told me that she estimated if they had gone all the way with this trial, it would have cost her about two hundred thousand dollars now thinking about the abh situation if giselle is right and anastasia spent about four hundred thousand dollars on that case that's where blend bunny could have ended up if she didn't just listen to the cease and desist discontinue the palette and move on with her life because what's sad what's so sad is that it doesn't matter if the person has no grounds you still have to pay the legal fees and one thing giselle was explaining to me is that in a lot of court cases if someone brings a frivolous lawsuit, you can have your lawyer file for that other party to pay your legal fees because they wasted your time. But in trademark lawsuits, 
they don't have that kind of protection. And that might be why there are so many of these things happening. Do you remember when Pat McGrath went after Rose Inc. for using the word divine in her products? They fought it for a little while, but Rose Inc. ended up pulling the divine products because of it. Was Pat McGrath in the right? Probably not, but it was gonna cost too much in order to continue the things. And the people that file these lawsuits, the companies that file these lawsuits, they are counting on the other party to fold because they don't want to pay the legal fees that it takes. It's the way for somebody, like Giselle said, somebody with deep pockets to bury a potential competitor. The rest of Giselle's video is very interesting. I am going to link the full video down below. In it, she talks about knockoff products sold on places like Wish and Alibaba. She also talks about why you often see similar products by different brands coming out at the same time. That's a very fascinating topic for another day. And there's a couple other things that she touches on, so I will make sure to link her video down below so you can watch it in its entirety. But at this point, my friend, I would love to know your thoughts on this topic. Do you think that Maggie at Blend Bunny did the right thing? Do you feel like she should have fought it in court, that it's about standing up for what is right? And when you know you're right, you should stand up for being right. Do you think that it's worth the money in order to do that. I would love to hear any and all opinions down in the comment section down below. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Again, if you did, please hit the thumbs up. It really does help me out a lot. It's a way to very quickly just say thank you for the video. And if you would like to subscribe to make sure you don't miss videos in the future, you can do that as well. It is also a free thing to do. And then my videos will just show up in your subscription feed so that they're easier for you to find. Thank you again for spending time with me today. I appreciate you so much. If you would like to spend a little more time because you're not done and you're enjoying this so much. YouTube should be recommending a couple of videos for you over here to watch. I'm going to include the ABH behind the controversy down there about their PR list. That was a fascinating behind the controversy. Also, we're going to put the top one is going to be one YouTube's going to pick for you based on your viewing history, what they think that you want to watch. But if you do need to go because you've got stuff to do, it's no problem at all. Thank you for hanging out as long as you did. Mad love to you and I will see you in a video very, very soon.